In today's episode of Unsolved Mysteries, we're going to be covering two of the most violent murders from the Philippines, known as the Chop Chop Lady. From the police reports, it was told that the two female victims' bodies were chopped up into pieces and wrapped into garbage bags in the same city called Davao City. Although the case for one of the murders has been solved, the murder for the other female victim still remains as a cold case for the murderer still hasn't been caught to this day. Are these two murderers somehow linked together? If so, what is the killer's motive for murdering these two ladies? And if they're not related whatsoever, who murdered the other woman? Also, why chop their bodies into parts? These are questions that still need answers, but let's dive deep into the clues and come up with our own theories and speculations. Let's get into this case. In 1993, Elsa Santos Castillo, who was the assistant personnel manager of Apex Motor Corporation, met a fellow man named Stephen Mark Weisenhunt, who was an American man from San Francisco. Stephen was on Elsa's team for their professional work, and while both were married to other people, being in close quarters apparently got in the way of their better judgment and started having an affair. Of course, people in the office noticed, and in an attempt to squash the rumors, Elsa resigned from Apex Corporation in April 1993. Despite this, the affair continued for several more months. On September 23rd of the same year, Weisenhut asked his driver, Demetrio Ravello, to pick up Elsa, who was then staying at her parents' house in Manila. Demetrio was instructed to bring Elsa to Stephen's condominium in Green Hills. He did just that, and a day went on as usual. In the afternoon, Elsa even asked Demetrio to deliver a paper bag to her old office. Stephen asked Demetrio to stay so he could drive Elsa back home by 10 p.m. According to Demetrio's sworn testimony, he waited in the building until 10 p.m. but received no word from either Stephen or Elsa. Demetrio decided to go home. He reported the next day to Stephen's unit where he found Lucy, the house helper, looking for a knife. Demetrio claimed he overheard Stephen telling Lucy he had a knife with him and that he even brought it out of his room. Demetrio was later sent out to buy cigarettes for Stephen. At 5 p.m., he was then allowed to go home and enjoy his evening. The next day, after running some errands in Stephen's office, including picking up a black plastic garbage bag, he returned to the condominium, where he was instructed to drive Lucy home and prepare for an overnight trip to Bagakbatan, where Stephen's family owned a vacation home. When Demetrio returned, prepared to leave for the trip, Stephen asked a very strange question as a test of loyalty. How long was he willing to work for Stephen? When Demetrio replied he was willing to work for Stephen forever, his employer broke down and confessed that Elsa was dead. Stephen said that Elsa died of Bagungat, which is a Filipino term for Sudden Arrhythmic Death Syndrome. Demetrio suggested that she be autopsy right away so that he couldn't be blamed for her death. However, Stephen had already chopped up her corpse, so this was out of the question. Also, according to Demetrio's testimony, Stephen further tested his loyalty by asking his help to pack up the corpse in garbage bags, and then those inside luggage which they later brought to Greenhills. Out of fear, Demetrio continued obeying Stephen's commands. He drove around Tagaite and Batangas, and when they left, they headed toward Santa Rosa Laguna, and when they were near Putin Cahoy and Silangan, Stephen ordered Demetrio to dump the bags. After they dumped Elsa's body, they then drove to Batan, and on the way there, they would stop at highways to discard pieces of evidence, such as Elsa's garments and her other belongings. It was around midnight when they reached the house. Demetrio claims he wasn't able to sleep for fear, that Stephen would also murder him. However, the following morning, the two drove back to Manila. When Demetrio got home, he immediately told his family what happened. His wife convinced him to talk to the fiscal judge in their town, who later accompanied them to the Department of Justice. They were referred to the National Bureau of Investigation, where he was initially met with doubt until a team of NBI agents headed to the place where Demetrio said he disposed of the body. There, they discovered a group of tricycle drivers had already discovered the body and a crowd was beginning to gather as the agents arrived on the scene. The rest of Demetrio's stories checked out. Elsa's belongings were also found along the highway where he said they were discarded. Stephen tried to defend himself in court, saying that the bloodstains in his bedroom were actually period stains from his sister-in-law. And Elsa? She died from bamboo gut and even asked his lawyer doctor to testify in court. Of course, the court had its own medical legal who actually did the autopsy on the body and declared that Elsa did not die from bamboo gut but from three stab wounds to the chest before being dismembered. And even if she died from bamboo gut, why would Stephen chop up the body? Stephen's story did not make sense whatsoever. 
At some point, Stephen came forward with threatening letters allegedly coming from Fred, who was Elsa's estranged husband. The judge noted, however, that the letters were directed at Stephen and not at Elsa. More to the point, Elsa apparently had reconciled with Fred a few days before her death. This was perceived as a motive for Stephen killing Elsa. This case was pretty straightforward. Judge Ricardo Molina, in a 35-page decision, said he found Stephen Weisenhut guilty of killing Elsa Castillo. He was sentenced to reclusion perpetua and was ordered to pay 100,000 Philippine pesos representing actual expenses for the funeral services and wake for five days. Three million extra pesos more by moral damages, exemplary damages in the amount of one million pesos, and attorney fees in the amount of 150,000 pesos. A year later, the case that captivated the country was translated into two films. Chris Aquino, who was a widely known television host from the Philippines, starred in the Elsa Castillo story, portrayed as Elsa, as a tragic heroine confused by her own feelings and a victim of circumstance. In Chop Chop Lady, the Elsa Castillo story, Lorna Tolentino portrayed Elsa as an independent woman who knew what she wanted in life. After spending 19 years in jail, Stephen was deported to the U.S. to serve the rest of his sentence. He boarded a flight to California on February 23, 2013, after being released from the National Bilibid Prison. The immigration officials said that his life imprisonment sentence in 1993 was commuted because of good conduct while in prison. However, he is now blacklisted from returning to the Philippines. Now you may be wondering, this case is solved. Why is this mentioned on Unsolved Mysteries? Well, at the beginning, I have mentioned that two ladies were victims of murder, and Elsa Santos Castillo was one of them. There was another female victim who was murdered the same way in the same city as Elsa, but took place nearly three decades before Elsa's death. The major difference, however, was that this particular murder remains as a cold case. Let's dive into this case now. Sometime in the late 50s or early 60s, Lucia Tolentino Lalu left her hometown in Candaba, Pampanga to try her luck in Manila. She initially worked as a waitress at a small bar, and apparently she was really good with money. Her hard-earned money, which saved quite wisely, was enough to start several ventures. Lucy's House of Beauty, which was a salon on Mayhaliga Street and Pagoda, which was a restaurant and cocktail lounge slash nightclub located along the Rizal Avenue in Santa Cruz, Manila. During this time, Lucia also met Aniano de Vera, a police officer who was married, but who nevertheless fell in love with her. Soon, the two began living together in a common law marriage, and their union was blessed with a child. Like any career woman, Lucia was adeptly juggling her businesses and family life at 28 years old. Then on one summer day in 1967, Lucia disappeared. None of the old newspaper clippings mentioned whether Lucia's family members or friends reported her missing. Maybe it was because they thought she was just spending time with someone else. It seemed to be an open secret that Lucia kept other lovers. On May 28th, police officers found human body parts, a woman's pair of legs, cleanly cut in four pieces, wrapped with a newspaper dated May 14th. The legs were found in a garbage can along with Malabon Street, not far from Pagoda. The garbage collector who found the parts said that they were cold to the touch, as if they had come from the freezer. He also noted that the toes were well pedicured, like they belonged to someone well-to-do. At first, police officers and the media thought they may match the badly decomposed severed hand that had been found just a few days earlier in front of the barbershop along Recto Avenue. However, this theory was discarded after checking the decomposite rates on both body parts. Almost a day later, a torso with arms were found along the EDSA near Guadalupe Bridge. These parts were also wrapped in newspaper, this time dated May 23rd. The body was identified to be Lucia's, whose fingerprints were on file when she applied for a police clearance, back when she just arrived in Manila. Homicide investigators noted that whoever killed Lucia was someone skilled with a knife, or have some sort of medical knowledge since the parts were expertly cut. In initial reports, they also mentioned that since the body parts were frozen and scattered in different parts of the city, they were looking for someone with access to a huge freezer and an automobile. Several suspects were rounded up, most of them being Lucia's lovers. First was Florante Relos, a 19-year-old raider at Pagoda whom Lucia had supported. However, Florante was drinking with his friends during the time of the crime and he was released. He also did not have any motive to kill Lucia, the person who was both his lover and provider. She even rented out a love nest in Cubao where he could stay. However, the cashier at Pagoda also said that Lucia had already broken up with Florante. 
during the night of the murder, she also told Florante and his friends that Lucia may be at the beauty parlor if they wanted to see her. Some witnesses even said they were saw being dragged by Florante and his friends into the taxi in front of the parlor. These accounts were never verified. The second suspect is Aniano, Lucia's common-law husband for seven years. Many already knew that they were having problems. Their six-year-old child had been staying with Lucia's mother in Kalukan. Aniano was also prone to fits of anger and jealousy, having fired off his service gun three times at Lucia's pagoda and beauty parlor the month before she disappeared. The night of her disappearance, Aniano claimed to have dinner with her in the beauty parlor at about 6.30 p.m. He left immediately after. Some witnesses, including some of Lucia's relatives, said that around the time Aniano left, they even saw her in the salon, sleeping. However, this contradicts Florante's earlier testimony that he and Lucia had met at around 7.30 p.m. the same night, in another cocktail lounge on Rizal Avenue. There was another suspect, an executive of a printing firm who was also said to be Lucia's lover. He was never named in any of the reports, only that he was suspected because of a cardboard material used in wrapping newsprints that was found under the torso of Lucia. This mystery man seemed to have an alibi for the night, and this angle wasn't explored any further. The last suspect was someone who came forward due to his guilty conscience, a 28-year-old dentistry student, Jose Luis Santiano. It was June 15, 1967, when the news broke out that a handsome young man, son of a retired PC colonel, married, and father of five, confessed in his own handwritten statement that he experienced a mental blackout but remembers strangling Lucia to her death. Jose Luis was also one of Lucia's lovers and was one of the boarders of the spare rooms in her parlor. In his initial testimony, he said that Lucia had tried to seduce him and that when he refused, she threatened to create a scandal. This was when Jose Luis lost his mind and killed her. In his testimony, he even mentioned disposing of the head in Diliman, Quezon City, and carrying parts of the body in paper bags and boxes while commuting in taxis and jeepneys. Police later found traces of dry blood underneath Jose Luis's bed where he said he kept the body before disposing of it. It was never mentioned in old news reports if the head was ever found. Three days later, Jose Luis was singing a different tune. He retracted his earlier statement, saying that he wasn't the murderer, but was just an unwilling witness to the murder, which was in fact committed by three men. While the murder did happen in the mezzanine of the parlor where Jose Luis's room was, he said that two men killed Lucia while another man held him hostage while pointing a gun at him. A fourth man appeared in the following morning and planted evidence, the blood, in his room. Over the next few days, he allegedly also received notes reminding him to keep silent. The police insisted that Jose Luis did it, especially since they found a hammer with bloodstains in the mezzanine, as well as a knife and razors in his initial testimony. They claimed that he was merely following his lawyer's suggestions of retracting a statement. When Jose Luis was being held by the NBI, they also received bomb threats to let the murder suspect go. He was released later on, and some even say that Jose Luis is still alive and living abroad. Without any new leads, the investigator reached a dead end. The public, on the other hand, continued to speculate on the mystery. In 2003, a former Los Angeles police detective named Stephen Hoddle published a book called Black Dolly Avenger, The True Story, about a similar case that took place in the U.S. in 1947. In the book, Hoddle details his 15-year investigation after his father's death into the Black Dahlia murderer, whom he suspected to be his father, Dr. George Hill Hoddle. During his investigation, Steve Hoddle found that his father had been in Manila in the 60s, leading the younger Hoddle to believe that George was also behind Lucia's murder. There were some inaccuracies in the book, however, that Lucia's torso was found along Zodiac Street in Makati, when news reports stated that it was found along the EDSA near Guadalupe. Some followers of the mystery accept this explanation for Lucia's murder, but the case officially remains open. With all these suspect testimonies and Lucia's body used as evidence, the murderer ultimately is still never caught to this day. We will never know the killer's identity along with this motive, whether it was driven by jealousy or just pure murderous intentions. But at the age of 28, Lucia was a successful businesswoman with high aspirations to make it big in the Philippines, only to be tragically cut short by being murdered. Will the Philippines police ever find new breakthroughs in this case? Will the killer ever be revealed to the general public? These are questions that still need answers, hence why this case is unsolved.
Hey guys and gals, this is Mr. Shin Ramen, and I just want to thank you for making it this far. Did you enjoy the video? If so, it would be greatly appreciated if you can leave a like on this video and subscribe to this channel for more future content. Till next time, stay safe and stay scared.